All right, it's time. Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Church and our Sunday School class on a theology of public life. Pray you guys are doing well. Uh, missed you guys this week. <laughs> it's always good to be back in here on a Sunday. Uh, there's too, too, many, too many days between Sundays. Uh, so I look forward to the Lord's Day and getting together. Um, we are, have undertaken uh, this theology, cultivating or developing a theology of public life, lessons for Lot in the city of Sodom. Sodom. I don't know why I want to continue to say city of Solomon. I don't know. There's something about that L in there I just want to throw in. The city of Sodom. And uh, we've begun with part one. We're calling Leviathan Rising, uh, talking about the relationship between church and state. And each time we, we get together for these lessons on Sunday morning, I want to give you a, a, a brief review so we just can sort of reorient our minds on what we're talking about because uh, you get into a lengthy study like this when there's a week between each of these, uh, you know, 45, 50 minute lessons, but sometimes it's difficult to um, see our place in the, the big forest, you know, for all the trees. And so um, we'll give a brief review. And what we're essentially doing in this uh, first part in particular is uh, developing or cultivating a theology of public life. Christianity is uh, not going to be, isn't to be relegated to the private sphere alone. Uh, we're not to monasticize ourselves, uh, sequester ourselves within the four walls of our home, as the government would have us do or as uh, unbelievers would have us do. Uh, it is uh, a faith that uh, is to be proclaimed from the rooftops. And so um, this issue or of a theology of public life is really important for us to consider as time goes by because uh, we're going to need to think through as um, maybe as we think about the, the walls, as it were, closing in on the, the church from the outside in terms of the state or in terms of an encroaching secular humanism, uh, as the walls begin to encroach or cave in on us, uh, we need to respond biblically uh, and take a stand for what uh, the Lord would have us do in our generation. So uh, public theology will help us to do that. And as we develop or cultivate a theology of public life, we're also going to be looking at, in response, what we would, we would call a theology of Christian resistance. Uh, resistance to tyranny, resistance to government encroachment, and we'll talk about that more as we work through the, the fundamentals. Right now, what we're doing in this process is just laying a basic foundation, and I hope what has been helpful so far is just to get us um, uh, to begin to think about these things that uh, there is uh, in the Bible. Um, instruction for us, uh, good biblical instru instruction for how we are to relate to the state, how we're to relate to governments, um, and uh, that can help us answer questions that we face uh, even in our day with uh, these issues that appear to be complex, uh, really ancient and old, and uh, already sort of been there, done there, got, done that, got the t-shirt um, in centuries past that now we in our day are having to face. Um, so the Bible has answers to our questions with respect to this, and we want to take our time, lay a good foundation, and then as we uh, understand these things more fully, and I think um, fully also would include a good historical perspective on how this theology is developed, uh, then we can begin to formulate um, a response to that, which is, I think, is going to be really foundational for our church, really important for our church. Uh, what is the Christian to do? What are we as a church to do? And um, we have all kinds of hopes and aspirations in our for how we're going to honor the Lord, how we're going to pursue uh, the spread of the gospel in this uh, age. We're just getting started, and I'm excited about that. So, okay, tentacles of tyranny. Uh, today we're going to be discussing sphere sovereignty, and I want to give you a brief introduction, a uh, brief review of where we've been. We've been discussing uh, the biblical concept of jurisdiction, which again is a biblical concept. Jurisdiction is the authority to speak the law, and that authority, whatever jurisdiction you find yourself, is bounded by or governed by God's word. For example, an individual has jurisdiction uh, over an individual sphere, you could say. Authority over his own conscience. The government cannot um, compel conscience. The church cannot compel conscience. Uh, the Christian, the, the believer, the person has liberty of conscience. The family has a jurisdiction, husband over his wife, parents over their children. The state has jurisdiction, God's minister for good over the people uh, to restrain evil. And then the church has a jurisdiction. We're going to look at those more in, in depth today. The chirp, church may not usurp the authority or encroach upon the jurisdiction of a father, for example, in the household. The state may not usurp the authority or encroach upon the jurisdiction of, this, of the church. 
and they're increasingly doing that. Neither of those fears may compel the conscience of the individual. In other words, each one has been given a bounded authority, a delegated authority, a derived authority that is bounded by God's word. It's a jurisdiction. In that, we want to remind ourselves that one in particular has been given all authority. <laughs> His authority is unbounded and he has the sole sovereign right uh, to dictate, uh, including the conscience, the heart, the mind of the individual, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the one from whom all authority is derived. Matthew 28, verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations. Um, we then, after discussing jurisdiction, uh, discussed a corruption of that biblical concept and abuse of that biblical concept that has um, leached into the form of government that our founders had conceived of um, and has polluted jurisdictional boundaries in our country, and that is the separation of church and state as it's understood by the state in our day. Uh, we've talked about that some last week. Never meant to separate God from civil institutions. And I think as we continue to move through uh, discussions of that, uh, you're going to have the confidence to say from the Bible that that is the case. The separation doctrine employed by government's courts today, civil institutions, social institutions, has been used effectively to eradicate uh, any Christian influence on the state, and it's simply not the way that God has intended and is in itself an indication of tyranny, um, cutting itself off, the government cutting itself off from any influence by the church, cutting itself off from any uh, checks and balances from the other spheres. We'll talk about that this morning. <clears throat> and in effect, it's been, a, uh, we've, we've reaped what we've sowed with respect to that um, in terms of... Uh, uh, unchecked encroachment by the civil government with no um, uh, resistance, as it were, um, effective resistance from the church. Sam Waldron, in his modern exposition of the 1689, uh, which includes, our 1689 includes chapter 24 on the civil magistrate. It's interesting, isn't it, that our confession of faith has a chapter with uh, three articles in it dealing with the civil magistrate. Uh, that tells you that our, um, the, the, those very wise, very godly men who um, uh, wrote our confession uh, understood these things to be necessary and good, and so included a chapter in our confession with respect to the civil magistrate. Uh, Sam Waldron, explaining that chapter, says this, does it surprise you that the confession contains a chapter on the subject of the civil magistrate? Are you inclined to ask, what does politics have to do with Christ? If that is something of your response, may I suggest that you are a victim of a religious background which has retreated from its social responsibilities under a wrong view of the separation of church and state. Such an attitude has virtually denied the sovereignty of God over all areas of life. To restrict Christianity to the spiritual realm is ultimately to destroy it. It's an interesting statement by Waldron, and I think there's a couple of points in there that are worth uh, thinking about, meditating on. Um, that retreat um, effectively undermines the sovereignty of God over all areas of life, including the government. And so the church has to say, and, and I think Bible-believing Christians and good, sound, biblical uh, churches uh, need to put their foot down... <laughs> As my mom would say, put your foot down, uh, put your foot down, draw a line in the sand as it were, and take a stand for God's sovereignty over civil institutions and to be a voice with respect to that. Now, as we go forward in time, uh, there's going to be less and less tolerance on the part of the state, less and less tolerance on the part of Roman first and his secular humanist buddies to listen to any of that, all right? They're not going to listen to that, um, but we have a responsibility nonetheless to proclaim it on behalf of the king. Uh, that's our responsibility with the gospel and our responsibility to the state. And we need to be loud about that um, and not shirk from our responsibility because people don't like it. Last time I heard, 
Last time I understood, God wasn't really asking men's opinions about what he said or what he commanded. Um, he just simply commands it, and uh, we're to be uh, the voice of that command in our generation. Uh, so we're not to retreat from our social responsibilities under a wrong view of the separation of church and state. That attitude is denied the sovereignty of God. Um, Christianity is not to be restricted to some private spiritual realm. Uh, Christianity... Um, is God's rule over God's people in God's place. And that includes every square centimeter of this planet. Or if you're in the U.S., every square inch, right? So uh, um, we're to assert that um, as biblical truth and not shirk back or shrink back from, from doing that. And we're, we'll look at what the implications of that are and what that looks like as we go through the study. Okay, sphere sovereignty. Uh, since the Reformed Confessions... Of the 16th and 17th century, there's been many of them, um, in those centuries in particular, there has been, um, in each of those confessions, uh, a consideration of the role of government and the relationship of the church and the individual Christian to the state. Uh, in those confessions, you often find chapters dealing with the civil magistrate and uh, how we are to relate to the ch civil magistrate. And in years past, um, those things had to be thought of, right? They were living under tyranny. Uh, throughout human history, most human beings have lived under some form, some degree of governmental tyranny. And so Christians in, in ages past have had to contend with those things and deal with those things. And so over time, there has been developed, there's been cultivated a robust theology of public life that teaches us how we are to interact with the state. We've not had to um, concern ourselves as much with those things because we've enjoyed a lengthy period of peace in our country, or as far as we're concerned, our entire lives, where that hasn't been much of an issue. That's becoming an issue now. It has been an issue, and you know we're, um, think, timely in dealing with this now. Over that time, though, that theology has developed, okay? It, um, if you've read any Augustine, Augustine um, had um, uh, the, the, the City of God. If you remember, uh, have heard of that book or read that book, maybe um, some of you homeschool kids have glanced at it. <laughs> uh, maybe not read the whole thing. It's huge. But um, two cities, City of God, City of Man, that sort of developed later under Martin Luther and Two Kingdom theology. Uh, and we're going to look at the city of God. We're going to look at uh, two kingdom uh, theology. Uh, but that, got, that thought was developed further under Luther, developed further under some of the reformers. Um, as, as that theology of public life began to be worked out, uh, we arrive um, at Abraham Kuyper, who was a Dutch reformer in the uh, 20th century, early, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, who wrote on this in particular and has developed this thought even further uh, to the point where we've got a good foundation today, a good reformed basis on which we, a good reformed biblical basis on which we can consider the subject for ourselves. Uh, so I want to give um, an explanation of Kuyper's public theology, a summary if you will, of his public theology, uh, and this uh, in particular subject called sphere sovereignty. And we'll refer back to, uh, in particular, we'll refer back to Luther and to Abraham Kuyper in particular, when we talk about our own application of these things in weeks to come. Okay. This will be sort of a foundational, very basic, very 30,000 foot overview of the subject, but I think helpful as we're moving forward. Uh, one of the more recent of those developments in a theology of public life and very influential on um, uh, some, uh, some for the good, some for the bad. Governments tend to hate it. Uh, kings hated it. <laughs> Monarchies hated it. Uh, governments tend to repudiate it. Our government would certainly repudiate it. But that was the political theology of Abraham Kuyper and his work summarized in sphere sovereignty. Sphere sovereignty. Uh, sphere sovereignty includes a, a basic application of biblical principles. As we work through the spheres, I'll give you those biblical principles. And we'll look at some passages where those are formed. Um, and all of that within a historical context. Abraham Kuyper, as well as the reformers who were working on this, understood that these things were um, in progress of thought, as it were, uh, and have developed over time. 
All right, Abraham Kuyper was an elder with the Dutch Reformed Church in the Netherlands, heavily involved in Dutch politics. He was um, an elder in the church, uh, but also served as prime minister for a period of time. From 1901 to 1905, Abraham Kuyper was the, uh, the prime minister of the Netherlands. Um, leader of the first modern political party in the Netherlands. He led that party. It was the anti-revolutionary party, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he founded a newspaper, very, very involved in public life, social life in the Netherlands, founded what was called uh, the Free University. And that's where we see, um, if you've read any of Abraham Kuyper, uh, he gave a speech at the inauguration of that university in which he spoke clearly about sphere sovereignty. It's really helpful, really good. Uh, part of what drove Abraham Kuyper uh, in his sphere sovereignty, his public theology, was to cultivate a theology of public life by which Christians would engage the culture um, biblically for the sake of the gospel. It was to cultivate or foster Christian engagement in the culture, which is really important and grotesquely lacking um, for a long time now. If you guys, some of you are old enough to remember uh, the moral majority Decades past, uh, when Ronald Reagan was elected, there was much talk about the moral majority. Um, better called the moralistic majority or the moral light majority. <laughs> Wasn't a lot moral about that majority. Uh, they had a few political um, statements they would make, but that 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 um, there was a prominent voice given uh, to that group at that time. Uh, since then. Uh, They've been silenced almost altogether. We hear little else of that kind of thing at all. Uh, there was a reference this week to the, the day of prayer. And uh, a point was made that um, Joe Biden was able to get through the entire day of prayer without mentioning the name of God one time the entire day. Um, uh, and then they made the, the comparison that Trump mentioned it 11 times and Obama mentioned him five times, you know, those kinds of things. But... Um, Christians have been largely uh, silenced in the public sphere. Uh, it's not right that that's the case, and we need to resist that um, and uh, proclaim um, the gospel where we are able to and to look for opportunities to do that. But that's the state of our day today. Um, Kuiper wanted to get Christians engaged and get Christians engaged in the culture, and so he led by example in those ways. He saw a Christian worldview as defining three fundamental relationships, the Christian's relationship to God, the Christian's relationship to man, and the Christian's relationship to the world. And so he wanted to develop uh, in all three of those areas, not one or two of them, in exclusion of a third. For Kuiper, Calvinism was the only biblical system that made sense of these relationships. And the reason that uh, Kuiper relied upon a uh, thorough uh, Calvinistic theology in developing a theology of public life is because uh, he um, saw Calvinism as the only system that asserted the sovereignty of God over every aspect of life, every detail of life. And in that, we're reminded of the beginning of this when we talked about uh, Luther's doctrine of quorum Deo, right? Every second of a person's life, believer or not, every second of his life is lived under the gaze of an omniscient God who searches the heart and will judge the hearts of, and intents of men, uh, judge the secrets of men, as Paul would say. Um, God is sovereign over everything. And so uh, Kuiper believed that to be um, uh, critical in our understanding of our relationship, certainly to him, our relationship to our fellow man, and our relationship to the world uh, as a whole. Kuiper said, instead of a monastic flight from the world, the duty of the Christian is now emphasized in serving God in the world in every position of life. Right? Sounds like Luther's Quorum Deo, doesn't it? So whether you're on the job, whether you're in school, um, you're interacting with state officials or the government in some form, uh, you go to Target, you go to the nail salon, <laughs> wherever you find yourself, uh, you're living for the Lord, Quorum Deo, right? And, and uh, a robust Calvinism says that when you walk into the nail salon, God is sovereign, Right? <laughs> even over what you do with those things. Um, a Calvinistic theology of public life recognizes the triune God as sovereign over the whole cosmos, to use Kuiper's words. Uh, from this, uh, Kuiper's thought, 
we can derive three spheres of derived sovereignty. All right, derived authority or derived sovereignty. Three spheres. The state, the society, and the church. A biblical Calvinistic theology of public life um, was basically an application of this principle of sphere sovereignty in public life over those three spheres, the state, the society, and the church, right? Reformed Baptist guys with the, uh, uh, the Credo Covenant blog, if you're familiar with that, put uh, together sort of a helpful summary of Kuiper's thoughts on this subject. And it starts with the sphere of the state, the sphere of the state, referring to the civil government, and with, with respect to the sphere of the state, Kuiper made three assertions, right? Three theses, right? One, God only and never any creature is possessed of sovereign rights in the destiny of the nations because God alone created them, maintains them by his almighty power, and rules them by his ordinances, right? So you, you hear Kuiper's uh, Calvinism, uh, rich in that statement, uh, and that is biblical truth, right? I'm reminded of Daniel chapter 4 with respect to that, if you remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible. Uh, is this not great Babylon, which I have built with my own hands, uh, right? Nebuchadnezzar says, and the Bible says that while those words were still in his mouth, God ripped the kingdom from him, right? Made him like a beast, um, an ox to eat grass in the field, right? He says, uh, the, the Bible says that seven times shall pass over you, Nebuchadnezzar, until you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Now listen to this from Daniel chapter four, beginning in verse 34. Listen to this. And at the end of time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. My understanding returned to me. I came to my senses. After that, I was brought to my senses, as it were. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honor him who lives forever because his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? God gives kingdoms to whom he wills. Uh, but God is the one who rules over the kingdoms of men. And so Kuiper's statement, again, is a thoroughly biblical statement. God only, never any creature, is possessed of sovereign rights in the destiny of nations because God alone created them, maintains them by his almighty power, and rules them by his ordinances. Now, is that true of our country today? Of course it is. Absolutely it is. Uh, we'll talk about uh, why it's de deteriorated to the point where it has. But God is sovereign. God alone creates nations. He raises them up and he brings them down all by his almighty power. And God rules over them by his ordinances, by his commands. So when a nation, a government, um, trails from... Um, walks away from, abandons God's commandments, God's ordinances, uh, that nation is um, rebellious, uh, now an enemy of God by wicked works, you could say. Uh, that nation has gone rogue and faces the judgment of God, exactly what our nation has done today. Second thesis, sin has, in the realm of politics, broken down the direct government of God. That's an important statement. We're going to consider that in a moment. Sin has, in the realm of politics, broken down the direct government of God. And therefore, the exercise of authority for the purpose of government has subsequently been invested in men as a mechanical remedy. He means mechanical as opposed to, um, quote unquote, natural, right? As God intended, natural, mechanical. Okay, let's think about that statement. Kuiper understood that if the fall had not taken place, what, what would government have looked like? And when I use the word government, I don't mean it in terms of uh, the state that we know it as today. What would, let's say, what would God's administration of rule, what would God's administration of rule look like today if the fall had never happened? What would be the basis for his, uh, well, we got the mic over here, I'll come back to Lee. So, Ryan. 
I'm just thinking of Adam and Eve, how he made them upright, uh, where he declared his creation to be very good. So they were holy, uh, having the law of God on their hearts and given this commission to, you know, fill the earth for his glory. Very good. So I would think of uh, a spreading of humanity over the earth and government in the fear of God. So in everything that man is doing, God is the, the chief end of of uh, the governance of the people. Very good. So there was, and Kuiper sort of uh, references that, doesn't he, with the idea of a direct, the direct governance of God. Adam, all men at that time, were under the direct governance of God. What would have been the main, um, the main institution of administering that government on the planet? Um, initially, who, is, who did God put in charge? Adam, right? Adam his vice regent over creation, giving Adam the cultural mandate that Ryan just referenced. Um, Adam had offspring. What would have happened when Adam died? Who would have taken over? One of his sons, Tom. Adam wouldn't have died. That's true. Good, good point. I'm not thinking. But that's good. Adam would have continued to rule. Adam would have continued to be king. Very good. Yes. Maybe uh, his vice, he would have had vice presidents, <laughs> Maybe, as we might have conceived of them. Yeah, very good, Tom. Uh, yeah, his, his sons, like uh, his sons would have held uh, influence, um, would have held uh, a responsibility. We, we see that modeled in the Old Testament, don't we? Even with the, the, nation, the nation of Israel, uh, prior to the monarchy, um, you had a family units, right? It was Abraham and um, Isaac. Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes. Uh, there was this family, this patriarchal society, family government, where you had the, the father was the head of the household, so to speak. And as long as that father was alive, you had a sort of a patriarchal leader to the tribe. And that's the way that the government sort of uh, subsisted um, in, uh, albeit sinful, fallen World, that's the way that the government, um, the governance or the administration of God's rule existed at that time. Kuiper understood that if the fall had not taken place, sorry, I didn't come back to you, brother. Do you have something to add? Go ahead. No, it was, you just said everything I was going to say. I was just saying a theocracy because it would have been Adam and then uh, you know, his descendants, and like you said, all the way down to Abraham, Isaac, all the yeah. way down. And what popped in my head was, like when Jesus was born and uh, the wise men came through and told Herod, Herod said, hey, let me know so I can come and worship. Uh, Herod knew he wasn't the rightful king. Yeah. And here mm. the rightful king was coming. You yeah. Know, the rightful <laughs> governing body was coming. That's yeah, so what did Herod want to do when Herod wanted to kill him. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, yeah, Kuiper understood, we understand, that if the fall hadn't taken place, then there would be, have been no reason, no reason for the structures of civil government. And I think it's a, uh, um, uh, an important point and something for us to think about. If the fall had not taken place, if sin had not entered the world, if Adam hadn't died, yeah. <laughs> um, or because Adam died, uh, um, there would be no reason for the structures of civil government. Uh, we know how God would have administered his rule and reign on the earth had not Adam fallen uh, in the garden. Um, we would have had a, a patriarchal society, if you will, family-centric, submitted to God under the, rule, the direct rule of God. Uh, politics in the state then, politics in the state, are unnatural, unnatural or mechanical additions, as it were, developments in human history instituted by God with a purpose. Uh, Kuiper says a mechanical structure, a mechanical as opposed to a, na a natural, a mechanical structure imposed upon the natural organic relationships that bind men together. What are those natural organic relationships? Family bonds, marital bonds, you know, familial bonds, uh, work bonds, social bonds, right? All those things that, that naturally, organically bind men together. Um, government, civil government, is a mechanical structure imposed upon those things um, that God has instituted uh, because of sin. 
because of sin. God instituted the civil magistrate because or by reason of sin. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 8. And let's uh, look briefly at where that got started. 1 Samuel chapter 8. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, um, you have the rule, the direct rule of God. And that direct rule of God administered through the priesthood and the high priest in particular. And here you have a God's direct rule administered through uh, one who is essentially prophet priest at the time, which is Samuel. But Samuel uh, is about to, to die, and Samuel's sons uh, did not walk in Samuel's ways. Uh, there, it has become obviously evident, even to the people, that Samuel's sons uh, cannot take over and administer that rule effectively. The people are um, convinced they need a king anyway, and so they ask then Samuel for a king. Look at verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, Samuel, you're old. Your sons, that's nice. Uh, <laughs> your, son, <laughs> uh, your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Right? Make us a king. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. Bringing to an end, as it were, in their own perception or, you know, according to them, what they were intending to do was to bring to an end the direct rule of God over the people. Now, God didn't only directly rule over the nation of Israel, as Samuel is here. Uh, God rules in all the nations of men, right? All those pagan nations around Israel, God ruled over them too. Uh, Israel in particular, in covenant with God, is rejecting, even in covenant with God, rejecting the direct rule of God, asking for a king. Um, verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, which they have uh, forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also, Samuel. Now, therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. Right? Uh, God is about to institute the monarchy and uh, the rule of men, as it were, instituting civil government um, over the people, giving them what they ask for, so to speak. And God forewarns them, um, when you have men to rule over you in this way, here's what you can expect. Right? Samuel told all the words of the, of the Lord, verse 10, to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own for his own chariots and to be uh, his horsemen. Some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands, captors, captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground, reap his harvest, some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants." He will take a tenth of your grain, your vineyards, and give it to his officers and servants. He will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, your donkeys, put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants. You will cry out on that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we will have a king to rule over us, that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel heard all the words of the people and repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice, voice make them a king. We've reaped the consequence of that, haven't we? Um, we can be grateful to God uh, for the institution of civil government, um, when civil government acts in accord with the intentions of God, 
in it because the civil government is used to restrain the very sin that gives rise to these kinds of things, right? The civil government wields the sword, wields a delegated authority meant to restrain evil. And in that sense, God um, uh, protects and has provided for us, and that's good. But where men have corrupted civil government, that's the problem we're going to be talking about, okay? Second, sin in the, has in the realm of politics broken down the direct government of God that now has been invested in the hands of men as a mechanical, not a natural remedy. Third, the third thesis. We're still talking about the sphere of the state. In whatever form this authority may reveal itself, in other words, whether it's um, a monarchy, um, a republic, a democracy, whatever form this authority may reveal itself, civil government, Man never possesses power over his fellow man in any way than by an authority which descends upon him from the majesty of God. Another very important consideration. Whatever the form government takes, in whatever form it takes, right? In whatever form that government, that civil magistrate may reveal itself, man never possesses power over his fellow man in any way other than by the authority which descends upon him, is delegated to him from on high, um, from God. Um, so any power, any authority wielded over man that hasn't been expressly given him, delegated to him by God is of definition a tyrannical authority, okay? Um, government does not have the right. I don't care what kind of government it is. Uh, it doesn't have the right to exercise an authority outside the boundaries of what God himself has determined and does not have the authority to exercise its will over the people um, other than in ways that God has determined for their good, okay? Now, there are many, many implications of that statement. That's a, that's a biblical statement, uh, and it's a strong statement, and it applies today in our understanding of what is tyrannical and what, it, what isn't. I think, you know, um, I'm, over the years, maybe have, you know, just not thinking of these things um, as I should and maybe as I am now um, would have defined tyranny um, much more loosely. <laughs> but the more that I understand, uh, for example, that statement or what the Bible uh, teaches about these things, the more tightly and clearly defined the definition of tyranny becomes and the more tyrannical you see our quote unquote democracy or our republic. Um, there has been a grotesque, deplorable, continued persistent overreach of our government into individual rights, into um, other spheres that can only be defined as tyrannical and outside the boundaries of what God has determined for the civil government. And it's something that Christians should resist, should preach against, should stand against, should be culturally engaged uh, with um, for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of God's rule in the earth. The more that government, civil governments spread beyond their delegated or um, given boundaries, um, the more that we see what happens in our culture today right? An increasing wickedness, an increasing humanism, an increasing, you know, we're going to cast his cords from us. We don't want this man to rule over us at all. There's more and more of a pushing and a shoving of God and of Christians who preach the gospel out of the, out of the public sphere. And the longer that Christians, the longer that the church allows that to continue unchecked, the more and more that it happens to the point where, um, you know, you've got in many places in history, Christian, Christians huddled in woods and huddled underground, huddled in basements for fear of their lives. Um, Christians, pastors by the hundreds, thousands uh, being killed, murdered. Why? An encroaching authoritative tyranny on the part of the state. And so um, it, it, wherever the, the state encroaches, the preaching of the gospel becomes hindered. We're already seeing that, right? Free speech laws, um, rights 
quote unquote, uh, that um, we have being infringed upon. Laws being changed, uh, a public becoming increasingly intolerant. Uh, I saw the video last week of that pastor on a street corner in London being manhandled, arrested uh, because of preaching from the Bible against homosexuality. And they arrested him on the street, happening more and more uh, in Canada. Whatever happens in Canada and the UK, just give it a few years, it happens here. Um, and this is the fruit of, of um, certainly wickedness and men are responsible for their own sin. But brothers and sisters, we have a responsibility to, to attempt to stand, don't we? <laughs> to, to do something, like um, instead of... Um, you know, just continuing our retreat, right? I think sometimes, um, you know, Christians just sort of imagine they're just going to continue retreating all the way to heaven, right? I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to heaven. Or I'm just going to keep retreating. At some point, Jesus is going to come back and fix this whole mess. But I can retreat long enough until he does. Now, we're not to retreat. <laughs> we're not to retreat. So uh, I think there's, there's, um, there's responsibility that... Um, is given to us in our generation to take a stand. And we've got to determine what that stand looks like, what it is. Okay. Sphere of the state. Second sphere. The sphere of society or the social sphere. The sphere of society or the social sphere. Um, the social sphere is, has a number of diverse parts within it, right? Made up of, of, of uh, components, if you will. Inside the social sphere, you have the family. Uh, you have business, right? Uh, industry. Um, a, a, a family may have had control over lands, right? Abraham had uh, control over great flocks, um, a great area of land. Um, another social sphere is uh, that Kuiper uh, talks about, um, we can think of several in this, this sort of category, but Kuiper mentioned science in particular. Science should be able to operate, in Kuiper's mind, should be able to operate without the encroachment of other spheres uh, for science to be um, um, the impartial, objective arbiter that it is. Um, hey, can you see how today, how uh, we don't have any real ability to trust anything that comes out of the quote unquote scientific community. Why? It's because it's been so absurdly politicized, right? Everybody's got an agenda. It's ridiculously liberal. And so um, people will just spread abject lies in the name of quote unquote science in order to fulfill their political agenda. It's ridiculous, right? And that's because of this encroachment we're talking about. Kuiper, I think, wisely viewed science as one of the social spheres that has a sovereignty that is um, exclusive to itself, a delegated sovereignty, right? Um, arts was another. Uh, education, education, very important one. Um, so he saw several components to this social sphere. You may think of others or think of fewer, but... Uh, there they are. Four main groups. Four main groups. This may help you categorize them. First, the sphere of social relationships where individuals meet and interact with each other. The sphere of social relationships where individuals meet and interact with each other. The Elk Lodge. No, that's not a sphere. No. <laughs> it's, but where, where do people, bingo night, you know, <laughs> where do people meet and gather together uh, social relationships, okay? Secondly, the corporate sphere, which includes all groupings of men in a corporate sense, such as, I'll give you some examples, universities, right? Uh, trade unions, employers, organizations, companies, Right, we can think of those, uh, the corporate sphere. There is the social sphere. There is the corporate sphere. Third, the domestic sphere. Deals with the family, marriage. That deals with um, education. Why would the, the domestic sphere deal with education? Why would that be the case? Pardon me? Yeah, homeschooling, but why, why is, why is um, education considered a domestic sphere? 
Anya? Because it involves one's children. It involves one's children. Yes, we're getting warmer. Yeah, Mike. Um, because that's where a child's education first starts. That's right. That's right. That's right. right? So we, were put, we put all those, those, those points together. Who's responsible for the education of our children? We are. It is a domestic responsibility. In other words, um, it's not the first and foremost responsibility of the state to educate children, uh, to, you know, to give our children to the state. Now, um, there are, and that, that's, I'm going to make two statements. First is there are circumstances in which that's um, a necessary thing, right? We find ourselves in circumstances where we don't have an opportunity um, and we rely upon the resources that are available to us to help us do what is necessary. But ultimately, like that we may, um, for example, uh, they may, you know, get a math education, uh, uh, education in math from a school teacher, but who's responsible for the education of that child? Mom and dad, right? Mom and dad. Uh, they may, because I are not a math person, right? I don't, I, I, you know, I can get you as far as like basic subtraction and then we're, we're going to be done. Okay. Um, uh, there, there, you can get help and assistance. All right. With educating our children, but the, the one who's responsible is, are the parents. The parents are responsible for the education of their children. I'm going to make another statement then ancillary to that is that I think uh, that we, uh, as the, the church, not just Cornerstone Baptist Church, but particularly Cornerstone Baptist Church, need to be thinking about rendering any other option, any other resource to educate our children an irrelevant consideration because we ourselves have, as the church have provided for our families, provided for people to educate their children in the way that God has intended. And I think that's a good reason um, why we as a church, and we'll talk about this later, um, should consider as quickly as we are able to do so, uh, Cornerstone Academy, <laughs> whereby uh, all of our children um, would be able to be educated uh, well educated without having to rely upon the state to do it. Okay. Um, so I'm hoping that will, will come. We'll talk about that later. Okay. The domestic sphere. Lastly, fourth, the communal sphere, the communal sphere, which includes all groupings of men in communal relationships, such as streets, villages, towns, and cities. Okay. So Kuiper saw in the Bible, those, um, developing communal spheres, cities, for example. All right. Each part of these spheres, Kuiper's, Kuiper argues, has sovereignty in the individual social spheres and these different developments of social life have nothing above themselves but God. Now that's an interesting statement, isn't it? Now think about your family. The family sphere has nothing above it but God, right? The state cannot intrude here. Kuiper says, in society, the chief aim of all human effort remains what it was by virtue of our creation and before the fall, namely dominion over nature. Now, the argument that Kuiper is going to give in sphere sovereignty here is that man has been given the cultural mandate. It's not the, uh, the authority or the responsibility of the state to accomplish the cultural mandate for or on behalf of man Man has been given the cultural mandate before God, and man has the liberty and should maintain the liberty to pursue obedience to the cultural mandate, what that looks like, under God with no one uh, dictating to him other than God. Uh, the state does not have the right to encroach on uh, the sovereign rights of these spheres um, in their pursuit of dominion. The state is impeding, as it were, our obedience to the cultural mandate. In other words, the state is not to take dominion for us. Man is to take dominion. The state is not to take dominion. Where does that come from? It comes from Genesis chapter one. Somebody give me a, give me a definition, like a quick summary definition. What is the cultural mandate? Where do we get that? Mm, not everybody wants. <laughs> yes, Michael. <laughs> Don't be bashful. I know I'm talking too much. I need to get you guys more engaged with, the, with some questions. Yeah, brother. Um, where God says, um, 
We'll let them be blessed and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air. We'll let them su 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 subdue, replenish, and take dominion. Very good. That's right. That's right. Be fruitful and multiply. You know, all those, uh, what that entails uh, in taking dominion. Yeah, thank you, brother. Very good. All right, that's from Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. If you want to look at that, um, the cultural mandate. I think there is a new covenant context, a new covenant context of the cultural mandate, and we can't be impeded there either. Um, God is looking for godly offspring, uh, godly worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. He says in John chapter four. So God desires godly offspring. How do godly offspring come today? Well, they certainly come in fulfillment of the cultural mandate to have children and raise those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I can say with a clear conscience before God and with great joy that we are amply doing our part with respect to that on a regular basis and continue to do so. So very, very happy about that. Thank you, brother. Uh, but it also comes through the preaching of the gospel. Right, the way that um, godly offspring, worshipers of God in spirit and truth, the way they're produced today is through the preaching of the gospel. Um, so we need to continue to preach the gospel and we don't need to be impeded in doing that. In contrast to this natural order, government is a mechanical device. The natural order is the way that God intended. Government is a mechanical device. It's essential power, the sword, which is power over life and death to restrain evil, uh, ought to be exercised only in the administration of justice. Kuiper, because government has been imposed upon those organic spheres, friction then occurs. Why does friction occur? Friction occurs because men are sinful and fallen and fallible. So friction occurs between between the spheres, so to speak, because that mechanical device has been imposed upon sinful, wicked men. And so this friction occurs. Kuiper says the government is always inclined with its mechanical authority to invade social life, to subject it, and to mechanically arrange it. I think that deserves a lesson in and of itself, uh, explaining that statement. The government is always inclined with its mechanical authority to invade social life, to subject it, and to mechanically arrange it. At the same time that Kuiper argues that the various social spheres will endeavor to throw off uh, all restraints of government, thus men will be continually faced with the twin dangers of statism or anarchy. Right, between those two ditches, as it were. But Calvinism, Kuiper maintains, avoids those extremes by insisting on the sovereignty of God. Where statism or tyranny is avoided and anarchy or chaos is avoided is when we are subject to the authority of God as sovereign. When we shove off that authority, we loose our bound our binds, so to speak, um, then we're given over to either anarchy or statism, chaos or tyranny. And well, that's what we're seeing. There are three ways, uh, we'll have to finish this up next week. There are three ways the state could support the social sphere to draw boundary between, the state should support the social spheres in these ways. They should draw boundaries and maintain boundaries around the spheres in order to um, avoid social conflict. The state doesn't draw or maintain those boundaries. The state is too busy trying to do away with them and overreach into them, right? So it does a terrible and awful job of drawing and maintaining those boundaries. Our founders did that with our constitution. Their intent in devising of our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, was to clearly define the jurisdictional boundaries of those spheres to um, prohibit or restrain encroachment by particularly the government, um, particularly the government, but by any sphere into another. A worker should never be misused or abused by his employer. The government can help draw boundary around that sphere. Um, Right? And we can think of numerous ways in which that we could think of examples. Secondly, the state could support the social sphere in defending individuals and weak elements within each sphere. In other words, the state uh, should protect the sovereignty of the church, so to speak, over its own affairs um, and not allow 
persecution of the church or restriction of church rights, the, the state could support that. Now the state continues to encroach upon that rather than protect it. Thirdly, to coerce all the separate spheres of society to support the state and uphold its legitimate functions, right? To call for support in order to do their job, to wield their sword, to render to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's, right? There's a, a legitimate function to civil institutions, and that is to wield the power of the sword to restrain evil and to protect those uh, spheres. Thus, each sphere has an obligation to render whatever dues necessary for the maintenance of the overall unity of society as protected by the state. We looked at the sphere of society. We looked at the, uh, the sphere of the state. Uh, next week, we'll look at the sphere of the church and the sphere of the individual as one. And we'll um, look at some of the applications and implications of Abraham Kuyper's sphere of sovereignty. We don't have time for questions this morning. Please forgive me. We'll, we'll, get, we'll allow time, more time for questions next week. Bear with me. Uh, let's pray and let's prepare for worship. So, uh, Father in heaven, uh, thank you, Lord, for the astounding and helpful um, sufficiency of your word. So grateful, Lord, for how wise, um, infinitely wise, you obviously and evidently are. Uh, is revealed to us in your word in helping us consider subjects like this. Um, thank you, Lord. Thank you for not leaving us without a witness uh, in that you've done such good to us. Help us, Lord, to serve you faithfully uh, within the sphere, with the delegated authority that you've given us to do our part in our generation um, to obey you in the great commission and all that you've given us to, to do. And we're grateful for instruction there. Help us to be faithful in it as we face uh, an encroaching tyranny and encroaching humanism and encroaching uh, darkness uh, that hates you. Help us to stand uh, for you with the gospel in faithfulness to your um, word, your will, our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. Thank you.